Well, welcome. You're behind the curtain for the beginning of the BJCP uh, webinar series. And John and I have been talking and, and enjoying uh, everything. And, and we're getting ready to just talk about, you know, kind of what's become a, a, a tradition for, for all, I think, five or six uh, webinars is to talk about a particular uh, beer. So we're going to do this as a commercial calibration. And I'm going to do this and hopefully not pour it on my keyboard. And John is going to talk about some of his impressions on this beer. And this kind of leads into the webinar, does it not, John? It does indeed. Yep. I, um, what we're going to do, of course, here, the commercial calibration, uh, I'm, we're tasting the Einger uh, Altbearish Dunkel, Dunkel, sorry. And uh, the Dunkel style is one of my favorites. It's just a really satisfying beer to drink. Um, it's got a big malty flavor, but no real roast to it. Um, it's, it's liquid bread, but not super heavy like a Bach could be, or like a double Bach especially. Um, it, is, it really is more of a standard beer, not exactly a session beer, um, like more like, say, the Vienna, but it, it is a very hearty, standard beer, very filling and satisfying. So um, what you can see is uh, this is a brown beer with red highlights. Let me get some light, more light on it. There you go. Kind of a mahogany color with some red. And uh, it's, uh, you know, very lovely. It's meant to be served in a, a tall glass like this, I believe. Um, you know, so very clear uh, mahogany color highlights. Yeah, aroma, rich bread, bread crust, not a lot of sweetness, not a lot of caramel character coming through. Uh, mostly just malty. Yeah, bread crust, liquid bread crust. That's what I. That's what I smell when I say I don't. I don't get any. I don't get any hops. Um, no real chocolate notes in this one. Although, the style guide says that the hints of chocolate, nuts, caramel, um, occur in some versions. Um, I'm mostly just getting malt. And in the flavor. Um, yeah, it's malty, kind of a, a sweet mid-level uh, flavor, uh, drying out to more of a traditional bread crust flavor at the finish. It's not a it's not a super dry finish, um, but it is a nice I guess what they call medium finish. It's it's not it's not sweet. It's not real dry. It's just kind of medium. Uh, what what are your impressions, Doug? Well, it's one of my favorite styles too, and and I guess I've been on several best of shows where it has has won, and it, I just always enjoy how refreshing and malty it is. I, I've kind of uh, gone too far with IPAs, and appreciate what it takes to brew now a real malty lager. And I mean, the, the, look at the head retention on this. Yeah, it, it, it's just a lovely beer. But I had to go to Asheville, North Carolina, to buy it. Uh, I mean, Greenville, which is not that far. So we were doing a BJCP tasting class, but uh, that was great. So I, I hate it. This this might be my <laughs> only one for a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was able it, to get a couple bottles at Whole Foods. but uh, Not at my Whole Foods. Uh, not at my right. Whole Foods. <laughs> yeah. Well, John, we're almost at the top of the hour, so we'll we'll – We'll kind of do our start, and if you want to continue to enjoy your, uh, your I will do so. Yes, yes, please and en enjoy it, and we will get started. Uh, so, welcome to the January BJCP uh, webinar. Uh, I'm your host, Doug Piper, and I appreciate you allowing me to join you as we grow our beer judging skills. Happy New Year to those that haven't heard me wish that, and I really appreciate all your time. Uh, I'm a certified Cicerone and a BJCP beer judge working on advanced rank. And these study groups and the webinars have been a way for me to share what I'm learning on my journey. So just like I can't get an Ienger 
uh, Dunkel in Greenville, South Carolina. I also don't run into experts like John Palmer just anywhere. And I have found that to be a huge help uh, for these BJCP exams and Cicerone exams. And so uh, John has been nice enough to share his time with us. So today, and, and, and as you know, for this series, we've been kind of working through all the questions in the BJCP written exam. So John's going to be speaking about question T14 and, and providing a complete all grain recipe and procedure. So we'll know how to do this. And we're going to move into that part of the webinar momentarily, but there are a few housekeeping items I want to kind of go through before we move into John's presentation. First of all, neither John nor I are part of the BJCP besides the, the rank that we hold. So the, we do not speak for the BJCP. Our answers are our own opinions, and it's a no guarantee of a high score. However, <laughs> I can bet you if John says it, it's probably darn good information. Uh, just uh, to remind you in case, if you're having issues uh, with the webinar, most of the time a screen refresh will, will get you out of it. If you're having trouble with the audio, check your volume level. Uh, and if you see me looking around, uh, it's I'm not checking Facebook or doing my email. I'm actually clicking everything, trying to make sure it runs smoothly and that we don't have a snafu like we had uh, a few weeks ago. Um, so this is a part of a series of webinars that John has been helping me with, along with Stan Hieronymus and several others. And we're just trying to get all the questions covered. Now, there, there is a, an out-of-pocket cost. And if anybody feels like they're getting some benefit from this webinar, please consider contributing. Uh, it helps offset some out-of-pocket costs. I volunteer my time. John volunteers his time. But just like you have to pay to take a tasting exam or uh, the Cicerone test, there are out-of-pocket expenses that need to be offset. So what you can do is appreciate it and we'll try and continue these webinars. Everyone that registered will get an email link to the recording. They'll also get John's slides. And this next time, it took a little longer than I wanted to to get the slides to you last time, but I'll try and get these to you hopefully by tomorrow. And I'll mention the two Facebook groups that we have. We have a Facebook uh, group, BJCP 101, which is basically for those that have not taken the online exam yet or their first tasting exam. And then there's a 201 group, which basically you have a BJCP membership number by that point. And that's what's required to join the BJCP 201 group. So join one, get through it and get to the next one. They're really great. Some awesome people in it. So with that behind us, we're ready to talk to John Palmer. And John, to me, doesn't need an introduction, but for those of you that have been living under a rock, <laughs> John is the editor in chief and publications director at the Master Brewers Association of America. He's had 20 plus years experience in aerospace and medical devices. He is the author of the largest selling brewing book, How to Brew, also brewing, brewing classic styles. And if those of you that have been on some of the previous water uh, webinars, the water book. So, John, I know I was looking through kind of some little background on you, and you had a piece of advice that I heard that was faith and virtue would be rewarded. What was the yeah. story behind that? Well, I had a, a, a PCHEM professor in college who, um, delightful man, um, but um, loved, loved chemistry, and he was, I believe, a Nobel nominee wore thick Coke bottle glasses and he would stand at the front of the lecture hall and with these large glasses and look this way and then say, my young friend over there, answer this question. And everybody's going to go on like, are you, are you pointing at me? Who are you, who are you looking at? <laughs> and he's like, yes, right there. My young friend right there. <laughs> and we're going, uh, 12, you know, whatever the answer, you know. but his, his, his favorite expression was, you know, faith and virtue are rewarded. And I think he meant that if we you know, had good study habits, we would do well on his exams, but I think, you know, good, good words to live by. 
Well, and you told me on the previous webinar that your father said, always say thank you. And may I say thank you for, on behalf sure. of the whole study group uh, and all these webinars you have done. Uh, you, you did at least one extra you didn't intend when it when we crashed you. And and then you've done an extra one on the questions and now this one on the all grain. So uh, on behalf of the group, uh, really, thank you very much. Happy to help. Yeah. So, John, after all that, I think we are ready to get into why we're here. So okay. how would you help us answer on the BJCP written exam the all grain recipe and procedure? Okay. Well, let's take a look at the question. Um, question says, provide a complete all grain recipe for brewing a particular style. Um, and I'll show you the styles that are typically asked here in a minute. But let's go over the parts of the question. 15% um, is a style description. Provide a brief description of the target style according to the 2015 guidelines. For old guys like myself, not the 2004 guidelines or the 5 or the 8, but the 2015 which I need to read one of these days. Okay, another 15% of the answer is provide the target parameters for your recipe, including batch size, original gravity, final gravity, bitterness, and color. 40% is list the ingredients and quantities and explain how the quantities were calculated. That's a key uh, point of that answer. Finally, 30% describe the brewing process from mash to packaging and give style-based reasoning for each aspect of the process. In other words, why are you doing what you're doing in order to brew that particular style? So we're going to address each of these points. And uh, for the style, uh, here are, is the list of styles. Uh, and you can see, you know, American IPA, double IPA, American Porter, Stout, Meritzen, Fest Beer, Weiss Beer, Doppelbach, um, Czech Premium Lager, German Pills, Strong Bitter, and Belgian Triple. These are the 12 styles that are usually, or that are, you know, the, the example that's chosen from on your exam. I'm going to be covering a different style uh, to avoid any, you know, conflicts and, and copying and so on. Um, and for that matter, any any verbatim wrong answers that get copied out. Um, I'm going to use a Munich Dunkel, um, but let's let's keep moving through the presentation here. So you need to read the 2015 style guidelines, um, and the reason for that is the simple truth is that styles evolve constantly. So uh, when you are writing up your description of a style, let's say it's Belgian triple or strong bitter, don't include any romanticism. Uh, don't include stuff that you've heard, you know, on the web, on the forums, maybe in some book you read, particularly mine, um, that, you know, claims to offer these, you know, factoids and tidbits about the style. Stick to what the style guide says. Stick to facts, the numbers, and the methods. It's only 15%, so keep it brief and to the point. Your recipe parameters must include the original gravity, sure, final gravity, that's easy, total bitterness target, IBUs, and now this is a target, okay, so you don't have to, you know, you don't have to calculate them, you just got to say, I, I want to have this many IBUs in the, in the beer. Uh, and also the beer color. And it says you can quote it in SRM, EBC, or a text description of the color. Okay? Either, either is fine. Your recipe quantities. You're going to want to talk about the batch size you intend to brew because that affects your grain weights and so on. Your grains and weights. Your hops, weights, and times. Your yeast strain pitching rate, and fermentation temperature. Now, I put asterisks here to indicate that pitching rate and beer carbonation levels are probably going to be kind of an extra credit thing. 
they're going to demonstrate to the examiner that you know what you're talking about when it comes to brewing, um, that you include these details. Um, again, you don't have to go overboard. You don't have to be super precise. Um, but I'll, I'll show you that as we come to the examples. Um, finally, we get to the, the meat of the question, the what, why, and how. 40% of your answer is based on the what your recipe includes and why it is appropriate to the style. You need to explain how you came up with the numbers. Okay, why explain why you're using those ingredients and why you're using those, those amounts. Uh, another 30% of your answer is going to be how the beer is brewed to make it appropriate to the style. For example, uh, in, the, in the Dunkel that we're going to look at, you know, is this style historically uh, decoction mashed? Yes. Um, so uh, your brewing process, if you say I'm going to brew it, you know, traditionally I'm going to do a decoction, great. Um, if you're not going to do decoction, if you're going to do single infusion, then you should at least say that in your answer. Say, even though decoction is traditional, I'm going to do it single infusion, and here's why. Okay, and that's, that's the next bullet there. Why or why not? If you can justify it, you should get credit. That's, that's the bottom line. Okay, um, now I'm going to go into review of points per pound per gallon and points per kilogram per liter. Um, this is intended to help you calculate your grain weights. Um, some people are fuzzy on these concepts, so that's why I thought I'd review it. When you collect wort in your boiling kettle, you're going to collect, you know, X gallons, like say, let's call it seven gallons um, at a specific gravity. And let's call that, let's say that is 1040, you know, and then you're going to, the volume times the gravity is your total points. So seven gallons of 1040 wort comes out to 280 points total. Your yield, then, is your points per pound per gallon. So, uh, and there's, you know, example of the algebra. Points per pound per gallon translates to points times gallons divided by pounds. So here's your points times gallons up here, and then we're going to divide it by your grain weight. Efficiency, your brew house efficiency, is your yield divided by the laboratory maximum yield, and that's typically 37 ppg. So let's say you got a yield of 28 points per pound per gallon. 28 divided by 37 is your efficiency, and I happen to know that's 75%. Okay. Um, same with points per kilogram per liter. Um, we're using kilograms and liters, same algebra. In this case, though, the the max, the laboratory maximum is 310. Um, your efficiency, let's call it 234 divided by 310, would be 75% efficiency. Okay, um, and where does this come from? Well, it comes from the total soluble extract in your malt. Um, this is the fine, you know, fine grind, dry basis, total soluble extract in your base malt, typically about 80% by weight. Table sugar, sucrose, um, is, is our gold standard, and it gives 100% of its weight as soluble extract. And it gives an original gravity of 1.046 per pound when dissolved in enough water to create one gallon of sugar solution. So. 46 ppg is our maximum, and that equates to 384 pkl, points per kilogram per liter. So if we say that base malt, a maximum, at 80% soluble extract, that's 80% times that 46 to get that 1037 or 37 ppg, which is also equal to 310 pkl. You, as a home brewer, are typically going to get about 75% of that maximum, 80%. So 75% times 37, or 28 ppg, and that equals 234 pkl. 
So when it comes to calculating your grain weights, we're going to use your original gravity times the volume that you intend to have, your batch size, to get total points and then divide that by this 75% efficiency PPG 28 or 234 to get your grain weight. Um, and here's a little, some math, just to give you some idea of how sensitive this is to volume measurements. Um, let's say you mash and lauder 12 pounds of grain to collect seven gallons of 1045. That's 315 points. Um, 315 divided by 12 pounds, that's 26 and a, and a quarter gallon points per pound or points per pound per gallon. That works out to 71% brew house efficiency, that 26.25 over 37. If you had collected more wort, seven and a half gallons, that would raise your efficiency to about 28 or 76%. If you'd collected even more than that of that 1045 wort, you know, then you would be up to like 29 PPG or 78% efficiency. So again, I want you to understand how sensitive your efficiency rating is to the amount of wort and how accurately you measure that in your boiling kettle. Just background info really at this point. So to calculate grain quantities, um, we're going to do another example here. Five gallons of 1055. That's 275 gallon points. 275 divided by the, our nominal 75% efficiency equals 9.8 pounds of grain total. Okay. Yeah, who's going who's gonna to measure, you know, exactly 9.8? It's going to be 10. Let's be real. Same with liters and kilograms. So you're going to do 20 liters at 55 points, about 1,100 liter points. Dividing that by 234 pKl, it's going to give you about 4.7 kilograms. Now, there's a big difference between 4.7 and 5 kilograms. You know, it's uh, 300 grams. That's um, nearly. That's over half a pound. Um, nearly a pound. This is about you know three quarters. So. This is a little, rounding here is a little trickier. Uh, maybe you say 4.8 um, to give yourself a little bit of buffer, but uh, just understand that right now this is our estimate on how much malt we're going to use for this fictional beer. That's the end of step one. Now let's, let's take a step back and talk about recipe formulation in general. Um, hanging in there so far, Doug? Absolutely. Uh, this okay. is this is great, and it's so so clear. <laughs> it's, good, good. I, I, you know, if I'm not asking questions, it must be really clear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I like to say that building a beer is like building a sandwich. You know, you start with the bread. That's you know most of them of your sandwich, um, and you uh, then you to that sandwich to that bread, you're going to add your main flavor. That's going to be say your meat. And then you're going to start adding some tertiary ingredients, some cheese, some pickles, and so on, and then seasonings, mustard, dressing, etc. The result, the, you know, this sandwich is going to be greater than the sum of the parts. Well, same thing with your beer recipes. Your beer recipe is going to be mainly your base malt. Let me go on to the next slide. Um, your base, base malt is going to be, you know, 70 to 80, even 90 percent of your grain bill typically. Your key specialty ingredients are going to be next, and they're going to be at around 10% by weight. Then you're going to have other specialty grains that are going to add accent to the beer. Um, you know, you're doing for body, um, more alcohol or whatever. You, you know, they're around 5% each. Um, also important to think about in thinking about your recipes, select grains that match your target style. You know, if you're, you know, for your base malt, use Maris Otter Pale Ale Malt for a flavorful English pale ale. Use German malts for German lagers. And then use flaked grains for extra body, you know, depending on what the style is. Understand, you need to understand what each kind of malt, each kind of base malt and each specialty malt brings to the table. 
So smash brewing, single malt, single hop, or, you know, um, single malt plus one specialty grain, single hop, is a great way to understand what each of these ingredients really brings to the table. Um, you know, if you're, if you're not familiar with, with these, some of these ingredients. Let's start with the base malt. So the base malt should be 70 to 90% of the weight of your grain bill and 70 to 90% of the flavor of your beer. Look at your, look at your base style. You know, if you're brewing a Pilsner, then you want Pilsner malt, not pale ale malt. If you're brewing a pale ale, then you probably want pale ale malt to get that little warmer, toastier malt character that Pilsner malt is just not going to give you in a pale ale. Uh, if, if you're doing a Vienna style, Vienna malt, it's a little warmer, a little sweeter malt, base malt. Munich malt has a richer malt flavor. It's like a, a rich bread and bread crust. So these are what these different base malts can bring to your beer. Next, we have our some of our characteristic specialty malts that get used. Um, you have your amber malts, which are like your victory and biscuit malts, and they provide a cookie to cracker and toast character, toasted malt character to your beer. You may want to use these at, you know, 10 percent of your grain bill. Um, then you have your aromatic and melanoidin malts, and these are richer, maltier uh, flavors, um, the rich, dark flavors of bread crust. And then you have your caramel malts, so your 20 Lovabond, 40 Lovabond, 80 Lovabond. These are all uh, different degrees of caramelization that have uh, increasing uh, depth of flavor from honey to caramel to toffee to toasted marshmallow, that burnt sugar kind of character in the 120. Next. Your roast specialty malts, um, you know, as you move into roast, roast malts, brown malt is kind of on the ragged edge there. Um, it is a very heavily toasted malt, bordering on roast, and it's its flavor tends to be kind of harsh. You don't want a whole lot in there. Um, I'd say 5% for brown malt. Uh, chocolate malt and pale chocolate especially is just on the other side of that harsh zone. Um, it has a very strong uh, flavor um, bordering on cokey, cocoa, coffee, and and dry wood. Um, very woody flavors, it seems to me. So, but then you, as you move up in the roasting uh, temperature, and uh, you you burn off some of those uh, stringent uh, volatiles, and you get some smoother flavors, uh, like you get from chocolate malt. Um, the chocolate refers to color, not flavor. You do get some cocoa and coffee notes out of chocolate malt, though, of course. And then, of course, you have your roast barley, which is definitely a more coffee or grain flavor, you know, roast grain flavor. Um, and uh, I should add, you know, then you have your debittered roast malts uh, that have had the husk stripped off. And that helps make for even smoother uh, roast character. It doesn't have some of the acrid and astringent notes that you get from uh, the grain husks when they've been roasted like that. Okay. Hey, John, just a, a quick question on malts. I yep. uh, was, was doing a beer judging this past weekend. We had one that had a kind of ashy uh, flavor. Yeah, yeah. And that <clears throat> it was attributed to maybe too dark a malt. What, what do you think? Might yeah, it, I mean, what was, the, what was the style that you were judging? It was actually a American style. Okay, American but it style. came out ashy. Yeah, that may be too much uh, black patent or black malt. Um, yeah. It could have been um, some, you know, some brown malt or the uh, pale chocolate that tends to have that very dry, ashy kind of flavor uh, that really, you know, it's it's astringency is what it is. 
um, those two malts have a lot of that. Um, so it, yeah, it, but you can also get it from just overdoing the black patent or the, or the black malt. So, so use black patent sparingly. Yeah. Yeah. That's a 5% max kind of, uh, malt. Um, this is similar to my brew cube. Uh, I, it's malt space and you know, you have your, the base malts that we talked about, the Pilsner, Pale Ale, Vienna, and Munich. You have your caramel malts on this axis, 20, 40, and 80, and 120 Lova Bond. Um, and then you have your toasted amber, chocolate, roast barley, and black malts across the bottom axis. And, you know, so as a 3D representation, you know, this helps you visualize the range and depth of malt flavor that you can build into a beer simply by using these three types of malts, um, your base malt, caramel malts, and your kilned and roasted malts. Um, get flavors anywhere from toast to graham cracker to nutty to cocoa, coffee, sweet bread, grainy bread, dark bread, you know, um, toasted marshmallow, toffee flavors. All of these are, are available within this malt space, depending on which malts you use. Let's see, next slide. John, are you gonna explain that a little bit more? Uh, I, this you know is, I'm gonna ask the dumb questions, but, but you got black malt down in the bottom right corner and honey just to the right of it. Okay, Can, so. Yeah, actually, the the honey corresponds to the caramel twenty up here. Okay. The black malt uh, corresponds to the black coffee. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. And then that's Vienna, what I need. Yeah, Vienna comes across it. It's it's like the brew cube, um, in terms of malt flavor versus beer flavor, or you yeah. know, um, but uh, it's really just to help you visualize that you can have combinations of all of these flavors from all of these malts in your, in your grain bill. Thank you. Sure. Okay, let's talk about hops a little bit in recipe design. Um, fair to say that a hop, a porter should not be hopped like an IPA. Um, and so many of my recipes in the first couple versions of how to brew you know, we I was doing doing the American thing where, you know, hopping every beer style, dry hopping every beer style, just because we could. Um, but that is not appropriate to style. So pay attention to the style guidelines. Pay attention to what the aromas and flavors of the beer style should be, and hop accordingly. Many times you only want a bitterness addition at 60 minutes. You just to get a balancing bitterness for the beer style, you know, um, again, read, read those aroma and flavor profiles. Um, you may not want much hop character. And when I'm telling people how to design recipes, you know, if it's a malty beer, make sure that you taste the malt, that you don't let, you know, enthusiastic hop additions uh, cover that up. So um, a porter, probably shouldn't have any middle to late additions. You may do a whirlpool addition just for some accent because it's fun, because you want to, but when it comes to test time, you know, say that you're doing this whirlpool addition just for the fun of it, that it's not really part of the style. That's okay, as long as you, as you state that and communicate it to the, to the examiner. So let's look at what hop additions contribute to the to the beer. Uh, mash hopping, um, I feel this is a waste of money. Um, I don't think you really incorporate much hop character into the beer by hopping in the mash. First wort hopping, um, very popular practice. I do it. Um, but uh, Stan Haramis says you're kidding yourself if you think that it's really adding much hop character to the beer, much aroma to the beer. Uh, it basically equates to about a 90-minute boil um, as opposed to a 60. So bitterness additions, typically 60 minutes. 
flavor additions, 20 to 30 minutes. Um, aroma additions of um, zero to 15 minutes. The idea being that you're leaving behind uh, more hop oil in the beer. Again, Stan, our friend, says that we're kind of kidding ourselves. Um, if you look at the hard data on how much oil evaporates after just you know 10 minutes of, of boiling. Um, to really get hop aroma in the beer, you want to do a whirlpool addition or a hop stand, as they're called, hop and hot steeping. Um, you, when you do whirlpool additions of hops, you do get some isomerization, um, depending on your work temperature. At around 200, I think it's 190 or 200 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, just off the boil, you're getting about 40% of the isomerization that you would get uh, at an actual boil temperature, 212 or 100 degrees C. Um, but, you, but you keep more oil when you're down below the boiling point. You keep more oil in the beer, and you get a lot more hop aroma. As you go down in temperature in the whirlpool, you, uh, your isomerization drops off pretty fast. Um, but you do retain a lot more oil. And some people say that to get maximum oil retention in, in whirlpool hopping, that you should drop your temperature to about like 165 or 175 degrees Fahrenheit um, to get below those vol volatilization temperatures. Okay, dry hopping, of course, adds lots of uh, hop aroma, but there's also some loss of IBUs that occurs when you dry hop, and we see this in our New England IPAs, so I just want you all to be aware of that. Yeah, don't, don't let that get cold. Yeah, really, yeah. Um, uh, here is a uh, hop flavors uh, character categories that I've uh, um, put in how to brew um, floral, fruity, citrus, vegetal, herbal, resinous, and spicy. Um, depending on which book you look at, um, which hop company you look at, I mean, everybody's got their own flavor wheel for describing hop aroma and character. Uh, I think these characters, categories uh, do the job well. Resinous, of course, covers um, everything from, you know, pine, uh, juniper, evergreen, uh, heather, tobacco, woody. Um, spicy is your fennel and black pepper, as well as your clove and mint, you know, spicy characters and hops. Vegetal is more of your celery, tomato leaf, green pepper, um, cabbage and hay, hay not necessarily being a vegetable, vegetable, but um, it is kind of a vegetal aroma. It's kind of a green um, aroma, and that's why I put it there. Um, citrus covers everything from lemon, lime, orange, grapefruit to bergamot. Fruity is more of your apples and includes your berries, peach, melon, and passion fruit, tropical fruit flavors as well. Floral is uh, your, you know, rose, geranium, as well as some of your, you know, actually more herbal uh, character, floral characters like lavender, which can also be characterized as an herbal aroma, depending on, you know, how you define things your, to yourself. But, uh, you know, so these are, these are the range of hop aromas we can uh, expect today. So let's start looking at building a Munich Dunkel uh, for, the, for the exam question. Uh, looking at the BJP, BJCP style guideline, uh, the appearance for Munich Dunkel says that it is a deep copper to dark brown with red highlights. 14 to 28 SRM, which corresponds to 28 to 56 EBC. Um, again, if you, in your recipe, you can either quote uh, a color, like say 20 SRM or 26 SRM or 28, or you can just say simply my beer, this beer is going to be dark brown with red highlights. That will cover it. Um, this beer typically has a creamy light uh, to ivory to tan uh, head. Um, 
in our Iinger sample. Got a fresh in mine up here. Um, I would say this is kind of an ivory uh, color. No, this is. I guess we're we're bordering on on tan here. Not as tan as say again a stout, but it definitely has some some color, some deep ivory, if you will. Hold it up, John, so everybody can we we can calibrate it. Yeah, it's a little hard to yeah. see. The, yeah, I'd say on mine it's it's between ivory and tan. Yeah. Okay, moving on. But a good clarity, you know, the style guideline does allow for some turbidity, um, you know, but in general, your commercial examples are going to have really good clarity. So, um, you know, how would I write this up? I would say they were looking at the style description. Sorry. Uh, Munich Dunkel is a dark multi lager beer of standard strength. It's characterized by rich, dark bread crust flavors and aromas and easy drinkability. The aroma is rich and malty, but not overly sweet. Um, and you can probably continue reading this for yourself. The malt flavor should be rich and toasty with hints of chocolate, caramel, uh, and nutty, but not roasty or sweet. The hot bitterness is low but balanced. Hop flavor should be low to none. And if it has hop aroma, it should reflect German style type varieties. The finish should be malty and medium dry clean lager fermentation character. That's what the, the style guideline says as far as the style description. So you should pull the meat of that description out and include it in your answer. Boy, I'd be hard pressed to say this Iinger has any chocolate in it. Right. I, I don't find it in here. No. I, and, that, and, that, and that's a BJCP example. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it just shows that there is a lot of variability among beers uh, to, yeah. it, within a style. So, you know, as a judge, you don't want to criticize this beer for not having chocolate. But you may, you know, in examining the flight, uh, say to yourself, well, you know, this beer doesn't have a lot of complexity. I like this other beer better. It's got some hints of nut or some hints mm -hmm. of chocolate in addition to the dark bread crust flavor. Now, you know, or you may say this one, you know, has some of this, but it's not executed well. It's not as clean tasting as this, you know, with this Ironer beer, uh, for example. So, um, you know, all part of the judging process. So the style parameters for Munich Dunkel are uh, OG 1048 to 1056, final gravity 1010 to 1016, alcohol by volume 4.5 to 5.6%. Now it's interesting to note that ABV is not required uh, as part of the answer to the question. You know, looking at the 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 text of the the question, they don't identify ABV, as, but if you can supply it, again, that demonstrates depth of knowledge to the examiner. Um, IBUs ranging from 20 to 30. A fairly low IBU range. Again, what you're looking for is a balancing bitterness that lets the malt really shine through. You're not trying to dominate this beer with hop character. Color, 17 to 28 SRM, 34 to 56 EBC. Um, again, textual uh, description, deep copper to dark brown with red highlights. Some from the style notes section, the grist traditionally can be made up to 100% of Munich malt, which is 10 Lovabon typically, um, and also concluded Pilsner malt, and traditionally was often triple decocted to develop uh, the rich color and melanoidin character of the beer. Slight additions of roast malt can be used for color, but shouldn't impart flavor. German hop varieties and yeast should be used. So these are the guidelines for you as you're 
you know, creating a recipe or saying this is the recipe you'd create, um, your, your ingredients should encompass these recommendations. Overall impression from Unitunkel according to the guidelines, characterized by depth, richness, and complexity typical of Munich malts and associated Maillard reaction products. Deeply toasty with chocolate notes, but never harsh, roasty, or astringent. Malt balanced yet easily drinkable. Well, this nails that all with the chocolate. Yep, yep. Um, so aroma, according to Stagaline, rich, elegant malt sweetness like bread crust. Hints of chocolate, nuts, caramel, and or toffee are acceptable. Yeah, I get I get a little bit of nut and I get a touch of caramel, mm -hmm. but not the chocolate. Um, yeah, and that, and that wouldn't age out either, I don't think. Right. I think that would, yeah. Still yeah. delicious. Yeah. Oxidation can make it a little bit sweeter tasting, uh, a little toffier, but mine's, mine. I don't really detect any oxidation in mine. No. Clean, clean lager fermentation profile. Low esters is what they're saying. Low esters and, you know, good dry finish or medium finish in this case. Um, slight spicy floral or herbal hop aroma is acceptable. Okay, therefore a malt forward beer. Um, so let's see, where am I here? Yeah, so if, again, looking going to the style guidelines, flavor dominated by soft rich complex flavor, dark malts, Munich 10, Munich 20, uh, should not be overly sweet. That implies mild caramel, toast, and nuttiness is okay. No burnt or bitter roast character. Hop bitterness uh, should be low, is low, but perceptible. Hop flavor should be low to none. Should be German varieties. Um, that is, you know, noble type varieties, land race varieties. Um, you could technically get away with uh, new German Varieties such as Huel Melon, which, but that's kind of out of style. Same with Mandarina Bavaria, um, where the hints of orange or you know, melon. Um, not exactly the traditional German variety, but technically German, so you could probably get away with it. Yeah, uh, in your in your answer, I'm saying. Mouth feel on the Dunkel is medium to medium full body, soft and dexterous, but not cloying, moderate. Uh, carbonation, which I interpret to be medium carbonation, and no astringency. Overall description, deep, rich malt complexity from Maillard products, no harsh or biting character from roast malts. So that's, that's the uh, complete style description from the guidelines. So now when it comes to, you know, your decisions on how are we going to brew this beer, are we going to use single infusion or use decoction? Decoction, boiling in other words, is traditional. It uses cooking to develop the maltier flavors from the paler malts, the Munich base malt and the Pilsner malt. Um, but single infusion mashing is easier, it's faster, uh, and we would use specialty malts to impart those malt flavors. Okay, so you really have that those these two avenues available to you. Do you do you talk about doing it the traditional way with decoction using just uh, Munich base malt and, and Pilsner malt, or do you talk about doing it by single infusion and using specialty malts to to give those uh, Maillard reaction flavors that deeper maltiness, the toastiness, and so on. Do you think John one has a shorter answer than the other? Because as you know, it's a it's a it's a time test. So the shorter answer would be preferred. Yeah. Um, well, as you'll see, when I I took the single infusion route, as we get into this, um, it was, you know, my my personal feeling was that it was easier and faster to write about doing a single infusion and why rather than trying to muddle my way through describing decoction and and so on um, but you know again just an example and I'm this slide I'm talking about 
you know, understanding decoction mashing for the audience. Um, you know, as as you going through uh, different styles in this question, you know, given the 12 styles they give you, there's a couple that use decoction, German Pilsner, uh, Munich, uh, sorry, not Czech Pilsner, Double Bach, um, as well as Fest Beer, Meritzen. I mean, those all can be decoction mashed. Um, and I want you to understand where decoction comes from. Decoction was invented when malting was still weird science. You know, we're talking, you know, 500, 1,000 years ago, you know, way before the invention of thermometers, way before we have specialty malts, way before stainless steel kettles. Um, you know, back then, uh, if, 200 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, barley was harder to malt. It had less diastatic power than it does today. Um, they didn't have the tests that allows a to modern maltster to um, determine if a, a sample of barley is ready to malt. Um, and you may not understand that that statement. And, you know, barley is a seed. It is a northern hemisphere seed that is used to growing on a stalk of grass and then falling to the ground and overwintering and then sprouting in the spring. So most of your European and, and UK barley varieties require this overwintering period where they're dormant. You basically have to store them for a couple of months at cool, cold temperatures in order for them to sprout. And for in that, and sprouting is, is really the basis of malting. Here in North America and Canada, um, we have bred out that characteristic through not through genetic manipulation, but through actual you know, crossbreeding and, and, uh, and plant breeding, traditional methods. We've kind of bred out that, that characteristic. And that's one reason uh, that you don't see Maris otter malt being grown in the, in the United States and Canada is because it requires this storage and overwintering uh, dormant period. Okay, so, Barley itself, my point is barley itself has evolved a lot over the last couple thousand years as, you know, we, as you know, mankind has, you know, farmed it. Um, uh, so um, the reason decoction was invented was that, uh, I think this is my next slide. Yes, decoction solved these issues by, um, you could mash in a wooden tub and then boil in a kettle. Um, you know, you kettles were scarce, you know, 200 years ago. They were expensive. Metal was expensive. Uh, and, you know, you'd, you wouldn't see a steel kettle. Um, you could get copper kettles or brass kettles, um, but they were, couldn't be very big. They just didn't have the manufacturing technology and, you know, equipment. Um, so, yeah, you saved your kettle for boiling, and you did your mashing in a wooden tub. You take a portion out, bring it to a boil, put it back, heat up the rest of the mash. They discovered through trial and error that if you started with, you know, like bath temperature hot water and mashed into that, took a third out, brought it to a boil, and put it back, stirred, took a third out, boiled it, put it back, stirred, did it again, put it back, stirred, they would get wort. <laughs> they didn't have thermometers. They didn't have hydrometers. They didn't have a way to measure gravity or sugar content other than tasting it. And they did, you know, so through trial and error, they discovered that this decoction method, third, a third, a third, worked to make wort. And that's how decoction was invented. Specialty malts largely didn't exist at this time. You had you had some brown malts 
um, you know, depending on the way that the, the malt after sprouting and germination uh, was dried, you would have various, you know, degrees of, uh, you know, color, um, anywhere from pale wind, wind malt, air dried to smoked malt to brown malt, where they're kind of your kind of limits. So uh, that's, that's where decoction came from. Um, and so today, in looking at, um, there's a diagram from how to brew um, for doing decoction mashing. Um, you can read about it there. I won't spend a whole lot of time on it, but uh, it's basically what I just discussed. Um, so in my opinion, decoction and step mashing were invented to solve brewing problems that we don't have today with modern malts. Today's malts were not designed for yesterday's processes. And therefore, you know, from a engineering professional brewer's kind of point of view, you shouldn't be decoction mashing today's highly modified malts. That wort will be over mashed. Um, and maybe this, maybe this is a little too technical or too detail or oriented for, you know, this, the purposes of this BJCP exam, but I think this understanding the boundaries of mashing and decoction and malts kind of helps you frame your answers. Um, you know, and it's important to understand that we can produce the same results as decoction by using single infusion with specialty malts. So that's why I said my answer to this question for this style was to do single infusion with specialty malts rather than doing decoction. Because I'm engineer that I am, I'm saying, okay, well, today's modern malt, highly modified. If I do decoction, I'm going to just mash the crap out of it. The beer is going to be too dry, uh, too fermentable, and it's not going to be a traditional dunkel. Okay. You know, if if you're in if you're in Germany and you're and you're able to get less modified malts that you know and where decoction works, then hey, you know, for that, great. But here in the United States, we got we got highly modified two row and Pilsner malt. This is a, a religious point, really, when we get into this. <laughs> and I'm I'm dying yeah. to ask a question. But to keep it going, I'm gonna add it to ask a question and we'll mm -hmm. we'll see if mm -hmm. we get there. By the way, we have 19 questions, John. Oh, okay. And I better we're get moving yeah, then, we're, huh? Yeah, we're approaching the top of the hour, but best explanation of decoction I've ever heard. Okay. I just, and I appreciate the history. That really helps. So thank you. Don't don't slow down. Okay. Here we go. We got about, um, there's 50 slides total, I think, in this. So I'm going to keep going. Um, so let's let's look at the numbers now for calculating our recipe. OG of 1048 to 1056, I'm going to use 1055. Uh, at 75% efficiency, I'm expecting 28 points per pound per gallon or 234 points per liter per kilogram. Points per kilogram per liter, sorry. Um, 55 points times 5 gallons divided by 28 equals 9.8 pounds. We're kind of back to that example, 4.6 kilograms. Um, you know, of Munich malt if we're going to be doing triple decoction. But let's let's play with this a bit now. Looking back at my guidelines for building a sandwich, building a beer, um, we want the base malt to be 75 to about 95% of the grain bill. Signature malts, 5 to 10%. Accent malts, about 25 to 5%. Munich malt... 20 Loba Bond is kind of an exception. It is technically a base malt in that it has enzymatic power. And it's also a specialty malt because it's been toasted higher and there's a corresponding loss in diastatic power um, such that it can be used up to about 50% of the grain bill. Munich 10, standard Munich malt, can be used as 100% of the base malt. It will convert itself. But the 20 Loba Bond won't. You need an additional enzymatic base malt uh, to accompany it. 
Um, so let's let's think about, I'm going to use for this grain bill, I'm going to use the Munich 10. I'm going to use the Munich 20. I'm going to use some Kara Munich 3, 60 Lova Bond, to get some of that caramel biscuit character and a little bit of that dark chocolate aroma uh, from the Kara Munich 3. If you look up the Wireman uh, sheet, it talks about uh, uh, some chocolate character. Also, I'm going to use the Carafa Special 1. That's a 350 Lova Bond debittered roast malt. It has coffee, chocolate, and nutty notes. But uh, I'm only going to use a small amount. I'm going to use it very mostly for color. I'm not going to I'm not going to try to pull any roast character out of it. And the three of the Car the Carafa Special One, the 350 Lova Bond has the least roast character of the Carafa malts. Let's see, there we go. So my final Munich Dunkel grain bill um, uh, uses the Munich 10 at about 65%. Um, I'm, you know, of the 85, I'm going to use 20% uh, by weight of the Munich 20 to add a little more intensity of the dark bread crust flavors from the Munich 20 malt. So the, the combination of these two Munich malts is my 85% of my, you know, grain bill. Then I'm going to use one pound of Kara Munich 3 to give me some of those uh, uh, caramel biscuit and chocolate notes at 10%. That's our signature specialty malt. And then my accent uh, specialty malt is the Craft Special at about 5%. I'm mainly using that for color. It shouldn't contribute any roast character. Um, this comes out to about 10 pounds. Over here on the on the uh, kilogram side, we've got 4.75 kilograms, uh, roughly the same amount and same percentages. Somebody says, but in theory, I could plant Maris Otter here and still malt it, though. <laughs> yes, uh, not so much. I mean, um, as I've had it explained to me, there are real differences in, in uh, agronomy and agricultural capability that you know that these barley varieties are actually adapted to so uh, depending on where you live um, that maris otter may actually not grow the soil conditions may be wrong for it uh, besides the overwintering aspect okay um, but sorry to wander off on a tangent there but I that is an interesting topic it really is Okay, so uh, Munich Dunkel hop schedule for my my answer. I'm gonna target 24 bit 24 bitterness units. 90% um, of that is bitterness only. I'm gonna use um, and so 90% of 24 is 21 and a half. Uh, I'm gonna use German tradition. Hey, nice traditional German hop. Um, you don't have to know the alpha. Uh, you just have to say it's gonna be 60 minutes and you're looking for this target bitterness units. You don't have to know the exact quantity. You can, on hops, you can just talk about bitterness units that you expect to get because everybody knows that you're gonna use brewing software to calculate the exact amount. Likewise, I'm gonna use two and a half bitterness units, 10% worth uh, by doing a Whirlpool addition that I'm gonna steep for about 15 minutes. Again, the actual amount one ounce or 30 grams, you you don't have to include. That's um, kind of assumed that you're going to figure out how much two and a half bitterness units uh, is by doing this kind of procedure. What you're looking for, of course, is malt dominating the aroma, a balancing bitterness, and then I'm as part of my answer. I'm saying I'm going to include some hop aroma as an accent to this beer. John, just to <clears throat> kind of give us a brief break, it's the top of the hour. Uh -huh. I, I know some people may have only allowed an hour, and so certainly feel free uh, to jump off at this point. Uh, I'm fascinated. Uh, comment 
is they felt like only 15 minutes had, had gone by. <laughs> uh, and and uh, so that, that was D.A. Bruiser. And uh, certainly I'm the same way. This is fascinating. And I, I, I wouldn't leave if you paid me. But I know some people uh, do need to leave. And if you do, uh, just know that this is recorded. Uh, you, everybody who registered will get a link to the webinar. Uh, you'll also get a link to all of John's slides. So don't feel like you've got to do screenshots. If you're viewing this uh, via Crowdcast, you will get a link soon uh, to download the slides. And what well, we got like 12, uh, 13, 14 more slides, John? Um, eight. We got eight more. Eight. Uh, even less. Okay. And uh, just a reminder on the questions. Uh, it looks like we have 19 questions. I don't know that we're going to get to all of them. Uh, kind of depends on John. This is his second or maybe third hour. Uh, we've been doing <laughs> webinars today. So uh, he may not make it all the way to the end of 19. So I would encourage you, instead of asking another question, choose one and vote it up. And then maybe that question will get answered. And maybe we can talk, John, if this goes too late, uh, to answer the remaining questions at another time. So, okay. uh, again, those of you have to leave, uh, we appreciate it. Thank you very much. And, John, we'll move on to part two. Okay. Um, water for Munich Dunkel. Uh, water is, you know, a part of the style and part of the brewing the style. So, you know, kind of building off last week's uh, web, um, water webinar, here's the brew, brew cube. Um, and let's let's look at the brew cube for the Dunkel style. It is a dark, malty, medium structure style. So we go to dark and malty and medium structure, and those correspond to um, a about plus 100 RA-ish um, for dark. These residual alkalinity numbers are guidelines. So that's why I say 100-ish. You know, I would say anywhere between 50 and 100 and, you know, 50 and 100 or maybe 75 to 125 would probably work, depending on your grain bill. Uh, so 100-ish. Multi, we're going to want a half to one sulfate to chloride. That is more chloride than sulfate. Okay. And... For medium beer structure, we're going to be looking for about 100 ppm of calcium, and you get that by going up here. So that's our water profile for Munich Dunkel, and that just saying that I'm looking that I my water for Munich Brewing Munich Dunkel should have, you know, about 100 residual alkalinity, have more chloride than sulfate to accentuate the maltiness and should have about 100 ppm of calcium for medium beer structure. There's your water recipe right there. You don't have to get any more specific than that. Yeast for the German, for the Dunkel. Uh, you want a German lager yeast. You don't have to worry about quoting, you know, WLP 0318 or whatever the actually may be. Um, <laughs> or the Y yeast or what other, any other brand, you just have to say German lager yeast, the, the type. Um, pitching rate you know, would be good extra credit. Um, going off of this standard recommendation of one and a half billion cells per liter per degree Plato, uh, that works out to about 413 billion cells or about four yeast packages or two packages with a two liter starter. And you can get all this information from How to Brew and other uh, resources as well. Um, I just, as a general aside, it is hard to overpitch. So don't, you could even say, I'm going to use 500 billion cells uh, just to get a, you know, very clean lager character. Um, probably don't need to go that far, but just FYI. Talk about the fermentation because uh, brewing the beer is part of the question. Uh, we'll pitch the yeast at 55 degrees Fahrenheit or 13 C. After four days, we're going to do a diacetyl rest. Four days should be about 90% of the total 100% attenuation of the beer 
generally looking at 75% apparent attenuation in any particular yeast strain. Uh, so I'm saying after, it's, it's about three quarters of the way done after four days as a guess. I'm going to do the diacetyl rest on day four by raising the temperature of the beer to 60 degrees Fahrenheit for the diacetyl rest. I'm going to hold that di diacetyl rest for another 40, four days and then check for diacetyl. That's the VDK part. Um, and then I can, once, once I've done my diacetyl rest and checked for diacetyl, any residual diacetyl, it's clean, then I can begin cooling for lagering. The recommendations for, for slow cooling for lagering, um, no more than 10 degrees Fahrenheit per day to get down to about 34 degrees Fahrenheit or one degree C for about two weeks. Okay. And again, all this is covered in the lagering section of how to brew. Um, packaging and carbonation. Okay. The style guideline says moderate or medium carbonation from Munich Dunkel. Um, that is about two and a half to three and a half volumes. There's a lot of wiggle room with medium carbonation. In other words, is not really defined anywhere. Um, low carbonation would be like one volume. High carbonation would be like five volumes. So we're looking at around three for medium. Okay. You can do that by priming and bottling uh, and going again to how to brew and the pitch and the priming tables there. That works out to about three quarters to one ounce of table sugar per gallon of beer at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Or equivalently, 5.6 five to 7.4 grams of table sugar per liter at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. This 60 degrees Fahrenheit represents the temperature of the diacetyl rest because that's the equilibrium uh, carbon dioxide concentration. When you start cooling the beer, you're not adding more carbon dioxide to it. It's going to cool down and still be at that 60 degree dissolved carbon dioxide level, that equilibrium. Um, on the other hand, if you're going to force carbonate, um, the beer is going to be at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, for example. And forced carbonation, you know, you're looking at the temperature of the beer and how much carbon dioxide it will now hold. So you and and you're going to set your regulator to somewhere between 15 and 20 psi, or 103 to 138 kPa, uh, to get to reach that three, uh, roughly three volumes of carbon dioxide in the in 40 degree beer, assuming that's your that's your uh, storage temperature, your keg temperature. So that's why there's different temperatures there at play. But here, you know, that's the point is here are your two options for describing how you're going to package this beer on the exam. All right, so now I'm these last five slides are my test answer. Okay, so the recipe, what it is, what is it? Uh, it's going to be five gallons, 1055, final gravity, 1014, 24 IBU, about 20 SRM, brown with red highlights. There's my description. My uh, ingredients and amounts, six and a half pounds of Munich, two pounds of Munich 20, one pound of the Kara Munich, half pound of the Carafa, um, 90% of my bitterness, I've said 90% of my IBUs is going to be bitterness. 10% is going to be from the Whirlpool. That works out to the 21 and a half and two and a half. So there's my hop schedule. My water ingredient is going to be residual alkalinity, about 100 ppm as calcium carbonate, 100 ppm of calcium, and a half to one sulfate to chloride ratio. My yeast ingredient is going to be German lager. I'm going to use about 400 billion cells or about four, four packages. The why. Here is my description. 
Munich Dunkel is based on toasty Munich malt, which historically was used for up to 100% of the grist. Decoction mashing was traditional, and its use developed a richer melanoidin character, giving it more depth of flavor, including hints of chocolate and caramel. This recipe will rely on single infusion mash and specialty malts to prov provide the characteristic flavors. 65% of the grist is Munich 10, provide the backbone. Signature specialty malt would be 20% of the Munich 20 with its deeper malty dark bread crust flavor. Care Munich 3 at 10% will provide accents of caramel and chocolate. The Carafa special will add depth of color that would have been supplied by the decoction. The overall result is a complex malty character that is not sweet and a deep brown color with red highlights. Grain weights are calculated based on five gallons of beer at 75% brew house efficiency, 28 points per pound per gallon. So there I've covered all of those bases with that answer. It's not a very long paragraph, but it does take a while to pull together. And right. Yes, yes. You know, by, by hand. Yeah. Uh, continuing that answer, in fact, um, the hops are traditional German varieties, mainly intended to balance the malty sweetness. And again, part of your answer is explaining why these ingredients and why these amounts are appropriate to the style. Okay. So mainly intended to balance the malt sweetness and any perceived hop character will have the typical floral, floral, spicy, herbal notes of German varieties. Hop quantities are calculated using the Tinseth formula for target IBU levels. So there's how I'm going to calculate those quantities. The yeast is a typical German lager strain and should produce a clean lager character with good foam. The pitching rate is the one and a half billion cells per liter per degree Plato, roughly 400 billion cells, and should result in no diacetyl or acetaldehyde with proper maturation, that being the diacetyl rest. That's my yeast answer. The water should have about 100 ppm calcium, twice more chloride than sulfate to accentuate the malt character. Again, this is why and medium mineral structure to support the malt flavors and body of the beer. The residual alkalinity of the water should be about 100 ppm to buffer the acidity of the malts and achieve a mash pH of the target of 5, 4 to 5, 6. Again, a little more detail than strictly necessary, but I wanted to, you know, uh, go off the deep end for y'all. <laughs> We appreciate it. Okay. So uh, moving on to the brewing process. Um, this beer will be a single infused and mashed as opposed to the more traditional decoction method. Again, alluding to the history and why I'm doing it this way. Due to the use of the modern, highly modified base malts and the use of specialty malts to provide the Maillard character that decoction would have otherwise provided. The mash will be conducted at a water to grist ratio of two quarts per pound and mashed in at about 150 to 154 F to achieve thorough conversion and medium body. Um, conversely, if I was doing trying to do a high gravity beer or a full bodied beer, I might say that um, I'm going to mash in at like 156 or 157 degrees to get a more dextrous wort to get more body in that beer. But for this particular style, medium body, I'm going with that 150 to 154. Uh, then going on to the boil, the wort will be boiled with the bittering hop addition for 60 minutes to achieve about 20 IBU of bitterness and no hop flavor. The Munich malt has been extensively kiln and should not have any DMS precursor. That's a fact. And therefore doesn't require a longer boil, which um, if, let's say we were doing a uh, pale lager style that had Pilsner malt, very often you want to do a 90-minute boil for Pilsner beers to help uh, fully remove the DMS precursor and keep DMS out of the Pilsner beer. Okay, going back. Um, some aroma hops will be added to the Whirlpool and steep for 15 minutes to add a slight hop aroma to, to the beer just for fun. Traditionally, a Whirlpool or Aroma Hop addition would not have been used. 
again, you're trying to demonstrate a thorough knowledge of the style to the to the examiner. After the boil, the wort will be chilled to fermentation temperature, 55F, and fermented with four packages of German lager yeast, roughly 400 billion cells. Fermentation will be conducted at 55, and after four days, fermentation approximately 90% complete. The beer will be raised to 60 degrees Fahrenheit for a diacetyl rest for four days to completely maturate the beer before lagering. The beer will be gently cooled and lagered for good clarity for two weeks at 34 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, as an aside, the reason I'm saying what I said there in that paragraph, that we're going to do a long diacetyl rest to completely maturate the beer before lagering, and then the, the beer will be cooled and lagered for good clarity. Um, this represents our new understanding of what lagering and lager beers are. Uh, the yeast, you know, don't, they don't downshift and, and, you know, do different things at cold temperatures. They simply go dormant. So these long lagering times that we used to talk about, six weeks, you know, to lager a German beer, you know, longer, you know, two, two, three months if it was a strong beer is not true. It's just, it is not, those are not, that's not real. <laughs> um, the yeast, yeah, they will take longer to maturate a beer at very cold temperatures because hardly any of them are, are active. They're mainly dormant. So to get maturation, the reduction of diacetyl, the reduction of acetaldehyde, and these green beer flavors, you need to keep the beer warm and you need to keep the beer, the yeast active. And that's what the diacetyl rest does. Once the yeast have fully maturated the beer, um, gotten rid of the diacetyl, gotten rid of the acetaldehyde, gotten rid of those green beer flavors, fermentation is done. Now, lagering is strictly a physical clarification process that is aided by cold temperatures. So that's why you're dropping the temperature down to near freezing. Um, those very cold temperatures will help agglomerate and settle and precipitate the haze and as well as dropping the yeast and leaving a very clear beer, okay? Um, so that's why that's why that language is in there in that paragraph. That makes so much sense. And you're going to love what is the top voted question. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> hold, hold that thought because you're, you're going to be able to dive into it a little bit more in a minute. <laughs> okay. Uh, going on to packaging. Um, now I'm going to talk about packaging the beer. And I'm going to say priming sugar at a rate of 0.9 ounces per gallon will be mixed with one additional package of German lager yeast in one quart of pre-boiled water and mixed with the beer before bottling. The bottles will be held at room temperature for two weeks before serving to allow them to carbonate. This should produce about three volumes of CO2, a medium carbonation level. Um, yeah, again, I'm going into extra detail on how the beer, you know, is primed and bottled. Um, I am using an additional package of German lager yeast uh, to mix with my priming sugar just to ensure, you know, good yeast activity after lagering. You could rely on the you know, yeast still in suspension, but on the other hand, they've done their job. They've gone dormant. They've been chilled and settled out, it's going to be hard to revive them to carbonate the beer. Adding, you know, some fresh yeast to your prime and sugar will help guarantee good carbonation. And that's why that's there. And that, I believe, is the last slide. Yes. Wow. Well, uh, we have not hardly lost a single person that started. Matter of fact, we gained a few, John. Okay. So this this is is absolutely fantastic. Now, I, again, I know you've been going hard for a while. Your beer is probably warm if it's not completely <laughs> empty. If you want to jump out and go grab a, a beer right quick, do you have time for a few more questions? I got time for a few, but I am running up against uh, family dinner time, and I got to get that on the table. So let's let's jump right into the questions and see how many we can answer. 
All right. So our first question, yeah, which you'll like, I hope this is not an off topic, but what about the downsides, if any, have you observed with the quick lager fermentation techniques that seem to be getting so popular? And that's from Sean Canass. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. Um, I've had uh, various lager brewers uh, prefer um, longer uh, lagering times. Um, they say that more time helps reduce uh, sulfites in some of the lagers that they brew. Um, that may be the case. And I'm there, there, there is still a lot of brewing science that is being discovered and hotly debated still. Um, sulfite metabolism and expression of sulfite aromas in beer is one of those areas where there's not a lot of, you know, experiments and data to, to pull from. So in, I guess we should say in theory, a, a good long diacetyl rest with, um, you know, good pitching rates, um, temper, you know, the right temperature uh, and so on should allow the yeast to fully maturate the beer before lagering. And if they have done all of that actual yeast activity warm, then they don't need to do it cold. There shouldn't be a need or they shouldn't, and there really shouldn't be a function based on this, what we know about yeast physiology and metabolism for doing anything further when they're down below 40 degrees. So but again, this is theory. We haven't done, I guess, enough experiments to prove it conclusively, but uh, I mean, but I mean, yeast experts in brewing agree in general on on these points well i love the way you explained it the first time i mean it just makes total sense okay good all right uh by the way what what is your hard stop uh at, is at the bottom of the hour uh whenever i see my wife's car pull in the driveway <laughs> <laughs> all right so you you'll signal me yeah all right so we'll just keep going till you say doug that's that's it okay yep <laughs> okay all right, so we've got a question, our next question here, uh, trying to see that. Oh, it's Anton Kahn, and I'm sure I pronounced that wrong. My, my apologies. Uh, many brewers and home brewers in Europe that I've talked to like to use a multi-step infusion mash schedule, like a carryover from the old lager decoction mashing with different rests, mm -hmm. even when brewing ales. Whereas most U.S. brewers use single temperature infusion mash. Do you find there is any benefit in using a multi-step infusion mash versus a single step mash? Or is a single step mash going to yield basically the same result? I can't wait to hear this answer. <laughs> um, yeah, this is that's a great question. Uh, technically, generally, yes, there is. Uh, there's really not much benefit, especially with today's modern malts, highly modified. Um, conversion, you know, trans transition, or the transformation of starches to sugars is happening very quickly. These, today's malts are enzymatically hot. Um, they're, they've, they're highly modified. They're, they're easy for the enzymes to get access to the starches. They mash quick. Uh, so you're, you're, kind of wishing that a multiple step is going to provide say more fermentability than a single single infusion would that being said i very often do multiple step infusions uh you know different temperature rests when i brew brewing's fun you know let's let's play with the equipment play with the malts <laughs> what the heck my wife is now here. My son is now here. I may have to pull out go pretty soon. Um, well, it, but uh, I think, you know, it's a great question. Um, I, th I, th looking at it from the other direction, I think you can get a great beer of any style uh, using modern malts with single step mashes. Um, you know, it's, again, it's a question of understanding where your beer's flavors are coming from. You know, if you want to do a decoction mash, if you, you know, look at your 
look at your malt uh, cert. If, if it's less modified, then yeah, multiple step infusion or decoction mashing may be warranted and you may get real benefits. Um, lots of people say that they get better head retention on less modified malts that they put through uh, a multi-step mash than they do from a modern malt with single temp infusion. Well, John, should we end at that? I probably should go. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I'm sorry. There's so many questions outstanding. Maybe we can, uh, maybe we can do another quickie, you know, next week or something and, and record some answers to these questions. Uh, cause I hate, I well, hate to leave everybody hanging, but, uh, duty calls. <laughs> hey, you, you have done more than enough. Thank you so much. This is fantastic. Well, you can go ahead and jump up. You don't need to wait for me to close. Okay. I will go over a couple of things for everybody who's here, but thanks a lot. Everyone. Go and, and take care of the family and, uh, I'm glad you put the uh, family over all this. <laughs> well, got to do what you got to do. Take care. That's right. Bye, everyone. Thank you, John. So everybody else, uh, we're going to let John go. And what I was going to do was just uh, close with a couple of things quickly. Uh, those of you that have been with me before kind of know a little bit about what we've got. But bottom line, I just really appreciate you uh, spending the time with me tonight as as we go through and kind of learn more about how to answer the BJCP questions. Uh, we're working on getting some more speakers uh, and we have maybe one of our even better speakers coming up on Thursday. Uh, I've already met with John Mallett and, and he is just a, a wonderful guy. Not, not that John and Stan are not and Andrew and, and Al, uh, but uh, I, I think you're just going to especially like John um, the best thing was, uh, we were talking about the, uh, commercial calibration and, and he just got all excited. And then when I told him that, uh, Stan Hieronymus had suggested two beers, he said, man, I can't wait to do this. So, uh, so I would suggest you to go ahead and register, uh, get your questions in. There were a lot of good questions here. And, uh, one of the beers I know he's going to want to do is a Guinness foreign extra stout. And that's going to lead into the, uh, the discussion that he's going to have with the malt. Uh, and as we just uh, wrap up quickly, I will be sending out an email link to everyone, uh, giving you the uh, slides that John has and all the rest of the details. And again, I would just remind you, this is all uh, viewer funded. And so, you know, I can only keep doing this as, as long as we get some contributions uh, I appreciate it. I have gotten several and a matter of fact, even got one this morning. Uh, so there's some great folks out there and I really appreciate you uh, helping make this happen. Another thing you can help with financial is appreciated, but if you have a speaker who can address some of these BJCP topics, uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, I'm still working on lining up the people after John Mallett, but uh, we've got, probably eight more topics that would be great to be covered. So if you know someone who's a subject matter expert and is willing to help BJCP judges understand the subject thoroughly, uh, please email me. I include my email and all the information. So with that, again, thank you for being part of the BJCP study group. Uh, thank you to the speakers. Thank you, John Palmer. And we'll look forward to seeing you uh, with John Mallett next week. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks.